banjo episode number two happens today. But oddly enough, this episode isn't specifically about the banjo, but more so about the banjo's tuning, open G, and how to apply it to your guitar. In today's show, I'll be showing you how to get to open G tuning. I'll give you some chord shapes, I'll give you some scale shapes, and I'll share some ideas on how to use this wonderful and easy alternate tuning. Hey, TAC family, this is episode 295 of the Acoustic Tuesday Show, a show packed full of inspiration and fun designed to help you get more progress, fulfillment, and joy from your acoustic guitar journey. Throughout today's episode, as per usual, I'll be sharing with you some acoustic news you can use, including a new triple threat album, a guitar playing fitness instructor, and much, much more. But first, grab your guitar and get ready to discover a whole new world. Think of that Disney movie, Aladdin, when Aladdin and Jasmine are flying around on the carpet singing the song, A Whole New World. That's gonna be you, but with your guitar and open G tuning. First things first, let's get into open G tuning. Now I'm assuming you're starting in standard tuning, so that's how I will give my instruction. Take your low E string, tune it down to a D note. Your A string down to a G note. Your D string stays the same. Your G string stays the same. Your B string stays the same and your high E string goes down to a D. So the only strings you're manipulating here are the two E's and the A string. Now, if you wanna know if you're in open G tuning, a great test is to just strum all the strings. Should sound like a beautiful chord because it is indeed a G major chord. And speaking of chords, Let's go ahead and start there. I wanna give you three shapes of chords here, and I'm gonna show you these shapes and also how to manipulate them from major to minor. So since we're starting out with an open tuning, which is a chord, the first chord shape is quite simply barring all the strings. Now, since we're influenced by banjo here, I'm really gonna be focusing on the high four strings from basically from the D string, to the high D string, since I'm referring to open G tuning here. So that very first chord, I want you up on the 12th fret of your guitar, and I want you barring everything across the 12th fret. Why does that work? Well, we're tuned to an open G major chord. So anywhere I bar on the neck will be a major chord. Now the 12th fret is a G chord, but I can move it around and play it anywhere. That's incredibly useful. Let's just pause for a second. Every chord shape has a root. The root for this chord happens to be on your third string or the G string. So whatever note that is, if you bar that fret, it will be that major chord. So if I say find a C note on the G string, let me go ahead and bar that at the fifth fret. That's a C chord, a C major chord. If I wanna play a D chord, find a D note on the G string here at the seventh fret, bar that to D major chord. And you can do that for any chord. A chord, find a A note, find an A note on the G string, bar it there at the second fret, A major chord. Okay, that's our first chord. Now we can take that chord and also manipulate it to make it minor. And all we have to do is flat the B string by one fret, meaning move the fretted note towards the headstock one fret. So if I'm here at the 12th fret and I wanna make a G minor chord from this chord shape, all I have to do is take that B note and flat it by one fret, again, towards the headstock. That will turn that chord shape into something like this. Let me see if I can get the fretting. So from that major chord shape, we now have a minor chord shape, and the same rules apply. We can move this shape anywhere we want on the guitar neck. You want an A minor? Move it down to the second fret. You've got yourself an A minor. D minor? Same idea, right? Find the root note on the G string, and then flat the B string by one fret. Okay, so that's our very first chord shape, the bar chord shape. The next shape we're going to look at is what I call the stair step chord shape. Um, that's just my name, it's not a universal name. What we're gonna do is fret the fifth fret of the high D string with our pinky, index finger on the third fret of the B string, middle finger on the fourth fret of the D string, 
rather G string, sorry about that. And then our ring finger on the fifth fret of that middle D. That is another G major chord. We did a G major up here. Now we have a G major down here. The stair step shape. Now this is just as movable, but you have to take note here. The root of this chord shape has changed. It's now on the D string. Okay, so whatever note is on that D string, that will name the chord. This happens to be a G note, it's a G major chord. If I wanna play uh, A chord, I'll just move it up two frets. It's an A major chord, right? And just like we made that other chord shape minor, we can do the same here. All we're gonna have to do here is take the note that's on the G string, flat it by one fret, move it towards the headstock one fret, we have ourselves a minor chord, the classic two for one special. If you know a major chord, find the third and move it towards the headstock. Now, if I'm talking through this and you feel like, whoa, Tone, you've just gone off the theory deep end, don't worry about the specifics. Just know that I'm calling out the note that you need to move. You don't have to take it any further than that if you don't want to. But for those of you who wanna dig into theory, I'll give you a little bit of the theory behind it. So we have our bar chord shape, our stair step chord shape, and then we have what I call the reverse stair step chord shape. We'll go up here towards the seventh, eighth, and ninth fret. Your pinky will be on the ninth fret of the high D string. Your middle finger will be on the eighth fret of the B string. Index finger seventh of the G and ring the ninth of the D. Yet another G major chord. This is just as movable. The root is now on the B string. So if I wanna play, say, an A chord, I bump it up two frets, I have myself an A major chord. Again, that A note is on the B string. We'll stick to the G major position since we are in G major tuning or open G major tuning. And as with the other chord shapes, I said you can take the major, turn it minor. We're gonna do the same thing with this. All you have to do for this chord shape to make it minor is take your ring and pinky and move it towards the headstock one fret. Strings are, or the fingers are kind of crammed in there, but you get the idea. Now I have another two for one special from the major chord shape to the minor chord shape. So there you have three different chord shapes for this open G tuning. Are these the only chord shapes? No, but they will prove incredibly useful to you so that when you get to this tuning, you kind of have somewhat of a roadmap. No, it's not everything. This isn't a comprehensive guide to open G tuning. This is more of a, hey, let's get your fingers on the fretboard and discover some things so you can actually use this tuning as a tool. You know, when I was first learning guitar, I felt like I would try alternate tunings, but they were always just for a specific song. And that's all I would use them for. I want you to be able to use open G tuning as a compositional tool, something to unleash your creativity. Hence, uh, what I'm showing you today. So we've gotten into the tuning, you've got the chord shapes, now let's go ahead and look at the scale shapes. These are just as movable as the chords are. So I'm gonna attach these scale shapes to the chord positions you have just learned. We're starting up at the 12th fret with that barred shape. We know that the root of this shape is on the G string. So we're gonna start the scale shape there. We're gonna go 12th fret on the G, 14th fret on the G, 12th fret on the B, 13th fret on the B, 12th fret on the high D, 14th fret on the high D, 16th fret on the high D, 17th fret on the high D. Now, if you're thinking tone, I, don't, I can't even reach those frets on my guitar. Don't worry, this doubles as an open position. We'll go open, second fret, open, first fret, open, second fret, fourth fret, fifth fret. Okay, it's the same exact shape, just in two different positions. The reason I showed it to you up here is because if you want it to be movable, say you want to play an F major chord, the root is on the G string, find an F note, play the same exact scale shape. All right, very useful stuff here. So that's one scale shape. The next scale shape will attach to that stair step chord. And what I want you to do for this is put your pinky on the fifth fret of that D string, that middle D string. We'll move to the G string, second fret, fourth fret, fifth fret. Move to the B string, third fret, fifth fret. Move to the high D string, fourth fret, fifth fret. That whole scale shape sounds like this. 
again, just as movable. If you want to play an A major scale, zoom it up two frets, play the same shape. Another two for one special. And the final scale shape will find us on that, what I call, again, reverse stair step chord with the root on the B string. Although I'm gonna be playing this in a descending fashion, just to kind of stick to the chord shape here. So we're gonna start right there on that eighth fret of the B, move to the seventh fret of the B, take your pinky and move it to the ninth fret of that G string, go to the seventh, go to the fifth, mimic that same pattern on that middle D string, ninth, seventh, fifth. You can play that, of course, up and down. Uh, there we go, and again, that's associated with that reverse stair step chord. So you've got the tuning. You've got three different chord shapes. You've got three different scale shapes that are associated with those chord shapes. They are all movable. If you don't wanna move them, don't worry. I've showed you kind of the most beneficial positions since we're focusing on G chords in G tuning, okay? Again, just know that they're movable. If you wanna play a C chord in G tuning, all you have to do is find the root, find your favorite chord shape, combine the two, bam, you got yourself a C chord. Just as a quick guide, if you're like, whoa, a lot of information, um, well, first of all, you can repeat this episode, right? You can always rewind, you can come back to this episode. In fact, I want this to be a resource for you. But for those of you who just wanna get going, just use the bar shape, right? Use it uh, open, use it on the fifth fret, Use it on the seventh fret. Boom, you got yourself a one, four, five in the key of G in open G tuning. One more thing before we get back to the show. I want you to have some beautiful chords, okay? So let me go ahead and show you a series of beautiful chords. I'm not even gonna name these, I'm just gonna show them to you because I want you to use them as a creative tool. We're gonna start open. Then we're gonna start fretting the first fret of the B string and the second fret of the D string, the middle D string. Man, is that pretty, right? We'll call this the staggered shape. Go ahead and move this staggered shape up two frets so it spans the fourth and the third. That's cool as well. Take your middle finger, zoom it up to the fifth fret of the D, lower your ring finger to the fifth fret of the B. Also pretty darn cool. We'll call this the stacked shape. Move that stacked shape up to the seventh fret. Another cool sound. They're all cool, I'll, I'll quit saying that. And then go ahead and take your middle finger, zoom it up to the ninth fret of that middle D string, drop your index finger to the eighth fret of the B string. Staggered shape. Now we're gonna move to the stacked shape. That'll be the 10th fret of the D string, middle D, and then the 10th fret of the B string. And then take that stacked shape and wrap things up at the 12th fret. Pretty cool, right? Let's play the whole series. Staggered. Staggered, stacked, stacked, sta staggered, stacked, stacked. It's very, um, what is that, Led Zeppelin Rain Song? I don't know if it's Rain Song or something else, Tangerine Me, I don't know, I don't know. I need to, I need to brush up on my Led Zeppelin. Nonetheless, I want you to experiment with this tuning and I wanna give you, again, somewhat of a roadmap so that you can start to explore this tuning. Now again, I'm really focusing on the high four strings of the guitar with the exception of that last series of chords because you can take the information that I just showed you and apply it directly to the banjo, which is a five string instrument, right? We're kind of ignoring the low string. We're kind of ignoring the fifth string for the most part, right? Those are drones. But one more parting shot before we get back to the show. I keep saying that, but this is just such an exciting tuning. Um, you have multiple D strings. You have multiple G strings. So anything you fret on any of those strings can be mimicked. Let's take this chord sequence for example. Well, I'm fretting the D string there in the middle. Well, I could fret the D string on the high. On the, I could fret the high D string as well, mimicking the same position. So I want you to take that information and again, start exploring this tuning. Now, officially, one more thing before we get back to the show. Did you enjoy this? Did you find this useful? Do you feel like you have a little bit more power when it comes to open G tuning? Do you have a little bit more of a guide? Let me know how it goes for you in the comments below. Okay, now back to the show. Time for your first dose of acoustic news you can use. And to kick things off, we have some wise words from Dizzy Gillespie. Specifically, he was asked about mastering his instrument. And this is what he had to say. You said somewhere that every day 
this trumpet gets harder and harder to play. Say, yeah, I would think after the years it would get easier. No, man. It's just, if you live to be a thousand years old, man, you would never master this boy. It, it waits in the case like this. <laughs> And looking up at you, it's and when you open you. it, you, and when you open the case, it says, uh -huh. <laughs> You think you're gonna play me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you have to fight it. You 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 in a you in a bo boxing match all the time with it. So you to fight it. Fight see, I would think some musicians would see it as a love affair. You know, like uh, like a like a harpsichord player. Yeah, well, you you ever see? Two Two fighters, when they, when they finish beating the hell out of one another, they hug and kill. <laughs> That's what I do to them. I was like, goodbye, brother. <laughs> the next news item I have for you is inspired by my McPherson Guitars coffee mug. Not really, but you'll see the connection. Have you ever heard of the guitarist Dave Bakey? Well, I hadn't either. I was checking out demos on McPherson Guitars, and I saw this player, and I was stunned. The clarity he achieves, the composition, I mean, the guitar sounds awesome, but in Dave's hands, it transcends to a whole other level, and you have to hear it. So first, you're going to hear a stellar McPherson guitar, and second, you're going to hear an absolutely stellar fingerstyle player. Here he is. <laughs> Some new music is next up on the docket. You've probably heard of Andy McKee before. You've probably heard of Callum Graham before. You've likely heard of Trevor Gordon Hall before. What do those musicians have in common? Well, yeah, they're all modern fingerstyle guitar players, but they just recorded a new album all together. A trio of amazing guitar players. The album is called Triplicity. You can pre-order it right now. And to get a little insight as to how this album came to be, let's go ahead and listen to Andy, Callum, and Trevor talk about it. Hey, I'm Andy McKee. I'm Callum Graham. And I'm Trevor Gordon Hall. We're here in Los Angeles at Invictus One, and we've shot a bunch of new videos for our project Triplicity. We have a new album coming out, and there's a pre-order campaign that you can jump in on right now at triplicity.com. Years ago, Trevor and I first met at the Canadian Guitar Festival, and shortly after that, we had a festival in Philadelphia where Andy was also playing. And from there, uh, we all grew to be very good friends, and we all sort of did some shows together, and then some shows opening up for Andy. And uh, each time we were playing some things together, some magic happened. Yeah, it was kind of a no-brainer that we needed to make a record together. It's always so much fun, and the music's just beautiful. I feel so inspired playing with these guys, and uh, so excited to finally get this record out. As you may know, we all play as solo instrumental players, but uh, in this project it was really exciting to orchestrate everything, especially on multiple guitars, having the baritone, acoustic guitar, and the high strung guitar, and it gives you more of a range to play with. It's been fun to sort of uh, take all the techniques uh, of this guitar tradition we grew up in and apply it into a band setting and see what comes from that. We recorded the album at Maple Hill Farm in Reading, Connecticut with Grammy Award winning producer Corin Nelson. We had such a great time making this album, and we cannot wait to share it with all of you. We've got big plans this year. We're going to be touring all over the world, plans to hit various continents and countries. But for now, you can get the album. So before the record is officially released, uh, we are going to be doing a warm-up to that uh, with a special release of vinyl. 
We have a bunch of copies of the Your Nice Classic Standard vinyl, as well as some very special limited edition copies. We'd appreciate your support uh, helping us spread the word as we built up to the official launch of this project. Our website is now live at triplicity.com where you can browse the campaign page and see all of the rewards and bundles available to you for this project. Essentially, the more you spend, the more you gon' get. This has been such a refreshing project for all of us. Um, you know, we're on the verge of this massive AI boom, and I know for all of us, it's been so important for us to have something real, a real connection with real human beings in a room. And we just want this project to be with all the rest of you who feel the same way. As always, we appreciate your support and we look forward to seeing you out on the road. Speaking of Callum Graham, this next news story is amazing. And to be honest, I don't even know what it's fully about yet. I saw this post by Callum and I just wanted to share it with you because I think Callum will be posting some interesting updates moving forward. Here's what he had to say in his original post. Spent the last few days doing various fascinating EEG neurological experiments exploring the power of music on the brain with the aim to improve the well-being of humanity through music. The results will take some time to process but will provide updates as they become available. I was going through these pictures and it just looked awesome. It's a room of, of folks in those brain study caps, for lack of a better term, and Callum is playing music. And there's one little video that kind of shows the brain lighting up, I believe, as Callum is playing. Now, there's no conclusive results as of yet, but just seeing this is fascinating because to, to understand that your brain is so active while you're playing music, it's just, it's a cool thing to see. I want you to see it. So let's check out that video right now. This is what's emanating out of your scalp. That's what we're actually picking up out of your scalp. It's not doing the math to figure out on this display to figure out from where it's coming inside the brain. So to stay updated on that study, make sure to follow Callum on Instagram. Uh, his Instagram handle is Callum Graham Music. Not only will you see results of that study, but you'll also hear some just inspiring music. Well, you kind of already did hear some inspiring music because of that new album, Triplicity. But nonetheless, somebody you need to follow, especially if you're interested in experiments like these. So cool to see, just so darn cool to see. And on that note, I think it's a great time to see what the TAC family is working on today. Every single week within Tony's Acoustic Challenge, the TAC family rotates through the five essential skills that help you learn songs fast. On Monday, there's a technique challenge, Tuesdays, a guitar lick challenge, Wednesdays, an improvisation challenge, Thursdays, a rhythm guitar challenge, and Fridays, a chord transition challenge. Today is Tuesday, the TAC fam is working on a guitar lick, and here it is. Your Tuesday Tack Guitar Lick Challenge is named Mr. B. Good, otherwise known as Johnny B. Good. Now, this is not the exact intro lick from Johnny B. Good, but it has a lot of Johnny B. Good isms and a lot of Chuck Berry isms. Here's how it sounds. <laughs> incredibly, incredibly, incredibly fun lick to play. And it uses triplets. We'll get into that here in a moment. But first, TAC family, to learn this note for note, please log in. This is your daily challenge. Click on Start Challenge. That'll take you to the teaching video. Once you get it under your fingers, you can play along with me on the play along video. Go ahead and adjust it to a speed that's comfortable for you. And don't forget to click on that tab icon in the lower right hand corner. That will allow you to pull up the tab right next to the video. So you can have both things front and center. Okay, so. This lick, it's cool, what gives? What's the deal? Well, the interesting part of this lick is that it's actually 
triplets. It's an entire sequence of triplets. I'm gonna count along with it so you can hear how it lays out in terms of the rhythm that's actually going on. Here's how it sounds with the count. Triple it, 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 triple it. And the same is true for the second part. Triple it, 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 triple it. This is very common in blues, and I would consider Johnny B. Good a quote unquote major sounding blues, but that's really, I guess that's really irrelevant to the point I'm trying to make is that you've heard this a lot, okay? If you've listened to blues, Muddy Waters comes to mind. Uh, he did the big 12th fret slide. Sometimes he would use a slide, oftentimes he would use a slide, but you can do it just fretting. You can go. Blues players do it all the time. It's quintessential blues, and it is centered around triplets, okay? Now, it's not always played in triplets, but this vibe, this, this way of emoting is all triplets. And what creates a little bit of a snafu is when you're playing an eighth note rhythm and then you move into triplets. I shouldn't say it creates a snafu. It's hard to conceptualize, it's hard to get under your fingers, but once you do, those triplets add an incredible amount of oomph to what you're playing. It's like, it's like putting an exclamation point on it. Let me go ahead and give you an example. I'm gonna play a basic shuffle rhythm, move to that lick, just the first part of it, and then come back to that shuffle rhythm. rhythm. And you're gonna hear kind of the, the, the gear changes happening. You're kind of switching gears and then coming back to a laid back rhythm. Here's how that sounds. not the smoothest playing, but I think you get the idea. It is hard to conceptualize and it's really hard to feel the pulse, especially when you're responsible for playing rhythm, like I was in a standard eighth note, one and two and, with a little swing to it. And then you dive into that triplet sequence. It's a great skill to have though. And that's why I really wanted to cite this lick. That's why I wanted to share this lick with you. Because being able to manipulate the rhythm is one of the most powerful things you can do as a guitar player, and it's oftentimes overlooked. We wanna play fast, we wanna play all the notes, we wanna play the licks that our guitar heroes played. All good things. But understanding rhythm, being able to manipulate rhythm, being able to have control over where the beat is, how, how listeners feel the beat, is so important. So. Oftentimes I'll recommend you know, playing with a metronome. While it's not the most fun thing in the world, your time that you spend with the metronome is invaluable because it helps you feel the pulse of the music and it helps you be able to switch gears like this lick uh, has you do, right? And uh, furthermore, I, I wanna mention one thing aside from the rhythm soapbox talk there. You know, I've mentioned this before on the show and I think it bears uh, repeating because it's really important to learn the things that your guitar heroes played. Learn the licks, learn the signature pieces of the songs. They're so important. And a lot of times people say, oh, you just, you just sound just like fill in the blank guitar player. Oh, you're learning a bunch of Stevie Ray Vaughan licks. Oh, you're learning a bunch of Tony Rice licks. Oh, those are a bunch of Norman Blake licks. Yeah, maybe they are, and that's totally fine. But part of finding your own voice on the guitar is playing what inspires you and then transforming it into something that is your own. Think of it as a starting point. You know, when you're learning language as a small child, you're mimicking what other people are saying. People don't say, you know, my, my, people don't say that my son talks just like me, but I hear Tony-isms in the way that he talks. So just the way that we pick up language by modeling behavior by modeling speech, that's how I want you to learn guitar. I want you to model your guitar playing after the people you love. Yes, copy them, but know that you're doing so in a way that will help you find your own voice on the guitar. Time for your second dose of acoustic news you can use, and we're gonna kick things off with another stellar guitar player, Dustin Furlow. You may not have heard of him before, but 
you need to check out his music. He just released a new song named Waltz for Spring. Here's what his post had to say. Happy to share that Waltz for Spring, a recent solo guitar composition, is now available on all platforms. One of the more zen pieces I've composed that relies heavily on a repeated phrase that appears different each time, but it is actually the same. Like every solo guitar piece I write, it is intended to feel like a journey with different movements. As opposed to a full album, I've been releasing little singles here and there for the last two years, but this fall I'll be releasing a new album entitled 30, produced and recorded by the same studio where the sound that you call home and solo were done. This will be a 50-50 singer-songwriter slash solo guitar album. I'm really happy with how these songs have matured. We'll be releasing one more single between now and then for baritone guitar entitled Skyline. And without further ado, here is Dustin Furlow's Waltz for Spring. Peloton bike? I promise this is guitar related. Just stick with me here. Well, I have a Peloton. I love riding it. And one of my absolute favorite instructors is Kendall Tool. She says the right stuff. She's motivating. And she's just, well, fun to take classes with. Well, I found this post from Kendall and it was very much non-fitness, fitness related. And I needed to share it on the show because it's about getting out of your comfort zone. Here's what she had to say. Steps out of comfort zone in three, two, one. I can't motivate in class and share about how important it is to get out of your comfort zone and allow yourself to be vulnerable and not also continue to do the same myself. This is an effort to be about it and not just talk about it. Getting way out of my comfort zone here and sharing one of the ways I love to decompress slash take care of my mental health. Music has always been such an important part of my life. Whether it was burning CDs for friends, yep, aging myself here, or making playlists for my parents when I went off to college, or sending people I care about songs that I know are perfect for them. It's something about melody and music that is so healing, just like movement, and it's such a huge component in how I take care of my mind and health slash heart. So here's a little Zach Bryan cover for you. Do things that scare you so you keep growing, always. I thought it was awesome. I just thought it was awesome. I think Kendall's a great person. Don't know her personally, would love to meet her, but she's awesome, and here she is performing that Zach Bryan cover. It'll be fine by dust light, I'm telling you, baby. These things eat at your bones and drive your young mind crazy. But when you place your head between my collar and my jaw, I don't know much, but there's no way at all. Mm-hmm. And I'm damned if I do, and I'm damned if I don't. Cause if I say I miss you, I know that you won't. But I miss you in the mornings when I see the sun. Something in the orange tells me we're not done. To you, I'm just a man. To me, all I am. Where the hell am I supposed to go? If you fancy yourself a songwriter, this next news nugget is for you. It comes from Andrea Stolpe. I've mentioned her on the Acoustic Tuesday show before. She's a fantastic songwriter in and of her own right, but she's also a great songwriting guide. And if you ever find yourself crunched for time and wanting to write songs, but feel like maybe you just don't have the time to do it, here's some advice from Andrea that will help you sit down and get writing today. If you're struggling to find time to write, consider 
what other reasons you might be hiding that keep you from writing. So there are so many things you can do in just five or 10 minutes a day. For example, you could do some free writing, journaling, maybe even sensory writing with taste, touch, sight, sound, smell, movement involved. You can find other videos on that right here on this channel. You could sing for five minutes straight and record yourself and just pull from that melodies that you happened upon that are cool. You could just play your instrument for the joy of it, even if you suck and record what you made and pull some ideas from that. There are so many things that you could do, not to mention collaborating. So take a minute and think about what's keeping you from using the little time that you have that you deserve and earned to do a bit of writing every day. I wanna address those with some practical tools that you could start pulling into a daily writing practice. And on those time crunched songwriting notes, I think it's a great time to wrap up the Acoustic Tuesday show for today. But yes, we have to take a sneak peek into next week. And next week on the Acoustic Tuesday show, you guessed it, it's banjo episode part three, where we're gonna take a look at banjo techniques and how to apply them to guitar. Yes, we're gonna be looking at three finger style banjo playing and seeing how that lays out on the guitar. We're also gonna look at claw hammer banjo playing and see how you can adapt claw hammer techniques to your guitar playing. We'll be making great use of open G tuning, so I'm glad you tuned in today and get ready because next week's gonna be awesome. You'll really be putting that open G tuning to use and integrating and infusing your guitar playing with some awesome banjo techniques. That's happening next week on the Acoustic Tuesday show. Remember, you can catch Acoustic Tuesday, well, every single Tuesday at 10 a.m. Mountain Time. Before I let you go for today, please do remember this. Your guitar success, however you define it for yourself, is directly related to your guitar routine. So please invest the time in developing your guitar routine and make sure to have fun every single day that you play. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for being a guitar geek, and I'll see you next Tuesday on the Acoustic Tuesday Show. Cheers to you, guitar geeks unite.